late 1870s, it was um, acquired by two museums. Now, uh, I believe uh, the Hay Foundation, in the, uh, but it, what's ironic about it, one museum has half and the other has half. So <laughs> I, uh, I don't know quite what the story is, but it was taken in, in portion. But what would happen, they would put the offerings in, uh, probably to Nicky Pazoo, be going across Hubbard Lake. Um, and that was a, uh, to placate the water spirit. Mr. Padu was the, was the one that uh, the tomahawks were left, uh, if, they, if they crossed any large bodies of water or the tobacco was left or whatever. Uh, and they would put it in, so evidently the shaman, that was uh, the Great Lakes uh, medicine man, or Chesapeake man, there was, there was uh, two, the Chesapeake man was a little higher than the regular shaman, would Evidently, after these offerings were put in, would extract them, take them out. Otherwise, the stone would have been filled with the offerings and they couldn't have put any more because uh, the spirits actually utilized these items. So I would imagine, uh, again, it would happen because, it, you know, a short period of time, that, that cavity would fill up and then they would know, hey, you know, the spirits ain't using them. Or, and maybe the spirits did take them out, whatever. But I, I would suspect that uh, they were removed by a, a special uh, guardian of that uh, of that figure. You know. What are the forked pieces of this? These are drumsticks. These are the typical drumsticks. You'll see all kinds of pictures of what they look like. But these are the ones. And these are on the um, a water drum. Uh, it was a hollow wood filled with water or, um, or hide, just hide over wood, and they were used this way. These two have uh, anthropomorphic effigies here, or any size marks in the back. What is that term? I'm not familiar with that term. Well, I intro is uh, any time on any artifact, there's a... Uh, reasonable facsimile of a human being, whether God or an actual human. And zoomorphic is just when it's animal. Uh -huh. Um okay. Oh, okay. See that's zoomorphic on the pair. It's a look at the beaver. See that's a zoomorphic uh they're effigies but it, it's to uh designate and to indicate if it's sort of human it's anthro like anthropology, you know, study of man. Get to the enemy quicker. 
uh, again, that part is just theory. The circle isn't. Everything is full circle. Okay, the club itself, uh, we run into a problem in the Great Lakes with the club itself because it's more indicative of the Iroquois uh, in, in the western uh, part of the, uh, or the eastern part of the United States because the Iroquois would almost could give, um, um, uh, uh, you could give credence that the Iroquois was the one, the, the confederation of tribes, Mohawk, Seneca, and Onondaga, and that, was the ones that created this time, this type of club in prehistory. But research discloses that in 1700, 1748 to about 1758, that the Massasaga, Chippewa, or Ojibwe, from right here, they were part of the Iroquois Confederacy. It was a, it was a short-lived, ten-year uh, uh, episode. But during that time, with wars, plunder, booty taken in battle, there was an exchange of artifacts, plus there was uh, marriage, intermarriage between the tribes. So consequently, um, they figured that it was brought back into the Great Lakes. Uh, 1750, say. And then it evolved uh, uh, for the next uh, 120, 30 years that, that the Ojibwe and the Potawatomi and the Ottawa used the club because what is known that when Edmund Brew and Grenoble came into, uh, uh, they were avant-garde uh, explorers of Champlain, when they came into Sault Ste. Marie, that the Great Lakes uh, tribe did have the club. So it's, uh, it's a little hazy. Um, but um, but uh, if, if you had to uh, make uh, you know a strong educated uh, uh, guess of exactly what it was, I would have to go along with that unless something further uh, comes down the pike, you know, about it. And it, it isn't likely at this late date that, that more information on something as perishable as wood is going to be found. But it can on the artifacts, it can on the stone, the problematic roles, the things of stone. Uh, yet can be interpreted as so many of us are problematical yet and they don't know just what they were used for. Can you tell us anything about the head? Okay, okay um, it's Masasaga or Jimbalay. This is, this is the, the tribe that became affiliated with the Iroquois, uh, the Confederacy, for the short period of time. And this wasn't the whole Chippewa nation. Uh, you know, I used all of them are correct, but, but Ojibwe is, is a more correct, and Chippewa is a uh, word corruption by the English when they first come in. But yet they're Anishinaabe. The real man, what they call themselves, is Anishinaabe. But if you use it in writing now or say Anishinaabe, people don't know. But yet I educate a little bit in using Chippewa because Chippewa is, you know, is, is, is just isn't correct, you know. But, but it's what, what's widespread now in uh, the white culture. It's like um, Indian itself. Because when Columbus hit the shores uh, of San Salvador, uh, he thought he was in India. So he called the first people Indians, and it wasn't correct at all. You know, he wasn't. <laughs> so the whole thing is kind of, you, get, you know, word maze. A lot of times to, to study the history correctly, you've got to uh, extract yourself from the terminology, because sometimes the terminology can weigh you down or distort, you know, and you've got to almost put yourself back into there and not, you know, into that time period. I do that a lot when I'm recreating uh, the artifact. They put yourself back into that time, time period and sort of uh, forget a lot of the, <laughs> the names because they're misleading. But it's of the, the Masasago or Ojibwe. Uh, they would put these uh, uh, on the poopies, on the wigwams, on the wigwams, the wigwams. And um, they'd be on poles or posts and, and stood up and, and, and wore, they put ear hides closer to their face and then put these over them. They were wore in, uh, in ceremony too, but not to the extent of uh, the Iroquois nations or not to the extent of the mass cultures of uh, the Northwest Coast Indian. But they did, and they believe again that it's an adaptation or, or something. Uh, brought cross-culturally from the Iroquois into the Great Lakes, uh, uh, the Chippewa. So, uh, 
they fought a lot. The uh, Iroquois Point in Sault Ste. Marie was a, a, where the Iroquois fought the Chippewa. They were not uh, they were not really peaceful, other than that ten-year period. And one faction of the of the Chippewa, which should be understood too along those lines, is that the Chippewa um, drove the Sioux out of uh, northern Michigan. The Sioux, uh, the Woodland Sioux, were all through and fierce fighting, unbelievable fighting. And uh, the Chippewa Nation is virtually the only nation that ever whipped the Suians, you know, the Suian speaking people. And there's about there's a Teton and on Papa and a Minikanjau and uh, the Santee. The Santee were close in the Upper Peninsula and they drove them out. And uh, historically, um, if you put man against man as fighters, uh, the Chippewa would be uh, better than Sioux at the time. It's something that isn't known, in his, uh, known that much in history, because by the time history was really recorded, uh, west of the Mississippi, uh, the camera was in, uh, the romantic writers, so to speak, come from the east, and they built this all up, and then Custer's defeat, and the different uh, military uh, uh, military men after uh, the, the Plains Indians, and it became more publicized because it was kind of more glorious. But right here in Michigan, uh, the Chippewa were the most uh, uh, ferocious of, uh, of the fighters, and it, it proved it, you know, historically. There's a few things over here. I'm here as two functions. Uh, some of the patina here from close to the human body is still on it. But it was worn, it's a gorget, and it was worn like this with high straws. And also it was used to put a piece of wood in it and pull, and it was an arrow, arrow shaft straightener. Uh, Viburnum was the wood uh, most used in this area for arrow shafts, and it, uh, it straightened it. So it was a, a dual purpose functional artifact. This is a broadhead. This was uh, this was found uh, right now where the Billy McQuaid softball complex is in Minnesota, uh, and uh, evidently on the, a route from over to the Bio Country uh, from the Savo River, it was it was dropped. Also, a uh, either a large axe or hole. Again, it's problematical. It was found about that same time too. These are full boom axes. Uh, they're quite rare. Uh, some of them are half grooves. This is three quarter grooves. Are those also from the fair? No, these aren't. These are from uh, southern United States. These are from southern Michigan and uh, the Ohio area. Uh, again, a mystery in this area of uh, finding groove axes. Most of them are of, of this type. Mm -hmm. Or right here, this is this is indicative of the type of self uh, axes that are found in uh, in the media area. Um, and why the grooves wasn't is still uh, conjectural. This is another full growth axe, extremely rare. The rarest of too expensive to the buy. Yeah, yeah, they just come up quite a bit in the mine. This is a whole uh, dorsal rib. Um, this felt a double purpose. It could be, this would be the true hole, but yet uh, archaeological did separate, you know, the connotation hole on this. What is interesting is the fact of the material that it was made from. It, it, it was got here and uh, acquired here in, in uh, Oscoda, a Savo River area. Uh, it was called Pinnacle Point now, but it's not any materials that would be uh, that would be close. Again, something that has always been mysterious is that um, right when I began collecting, when I first began collecting, all of the old timers, the lumberjacks, uh, the older Indians at the time, called these skinning stones, and uh, functionally. Uh, they would not be for skinning. They would 
would be so difficult to use, but it was something, uh, again, yet it's problematical and it's something to research more, but it has always intrigued me that uh, almost...